of modelers and, and data analysts. And one of the things you can do is actually uh, have, uh, have events on your team where you focus on a particular object with, where everyone's running their models with the same initial conditions uh, and actually handing off model results to each other. And that's exactly what we did. We had an intramural uh, workshop where we looked at uh, the space environment at Phobos. I mean, Stickney, we picked Stickney Crater as a kind of a, a nice point to look at for plasma oh. inflow and that kind of thing, but it's really the space environment at uh, Phobos. And uh, actually, this is, believe it or not, this is something we proposed in our proposal. So we actually did, actually did what we proposed, which is somewhat uncharacteristic for me, for people who know me. Uh, we actually call this, this these kinds of uh, uh, integrated efforts um, the Dream 2 Extreme Environment Program or Deep Focus Studies. So rather than having everyone, all of our investigators go off incoherently, we actually took some time to formalize sort of our cross theme integrations. And we did this as part of Dream. Uh, some of you may remember our solar storm lunar atmosphere modeling study where we asked what would happen if a solar storm slammed into the moon. It was called SLAMS. Uh, and actually got like five or six papers out of this in a, in a dedicated section in uh, JGR Planets. So, uh, you know, so this, we wanted to do the same kind of thing here for Phobos. So the questions that we're addressing are actually about the modern Phobos. And that's why this talk is actually so different from the other talks where they talk about giga years and stuff like that. We're asking what's going on right now? Like how does a solar wind and Martian plasma flow about Phobos? And for each science question, we actually had an exploration question. You know, we framed it in exploration type question. So if you know that plasma environment, what can you say about electrical grounding? What about the exosphere? You know, is it surface bounded? And you could probably already guess the answer to that. And if that if what that material that's being uh, blown off uh, can you use that to sense composition and resources. You know, how is the uh, regolith modified by the space environment? Do you get OH uh, implanting, solar wind uh, hi hydrogen implanting to make OH like you do at the moon? You know, how do you define dust in the low G environment here? Uh, in the, uh, where you think about uh, cohesion? You know, what's What's the the, the 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 size where gravity you know, where cohesion exceeds gravity, and what's the radiation environment like? So these are more modern day environmental type questions. So here's our layout for this. Uh, we actually had some inputs like Maven. Uh, we had uh, uh, um, MHD models of solar events from the Community Coordinated Modeling Center. This is a heliophysics program. We had Crater and Virtual Energetic Particle uh, Observatory. This is another heliophysics program run by uh, uh, John Cooper. Uh, uh, and they actually provided uh, uh, inputs to uh, a sets of models in, with, uh, under exosphere, plasma, surface, and radiation. Uh, and so we actually spent six months prior to an April workshop getting all this together, starting our models, running them. Again, common target, common initial data sets, and run in, in sequence where one model can hand off to the other. And we actually had a whole set of great uh, papers. For example, we were looking at the electrostatic and, and plasma environment around Phobos, which really has not been discussed that much. And I'll show you some results of that. We looked at sputtering of neutral emission in uh, Andrew Poppy, actually I think is gonna present some of that work here. Uh, we looked at solar wind uh, hydrogen diffusion and plantation and diffusion. Uh, Dick Hodges just has a paper out about methane at the moon where carbon from solar wind and hydrogen maybe get together to make new chemistry, uh, methane production at the moon. Could that be going on at Phobos? Uh, we have impact weathering, a lot of great radiation work, and you, know, you have deep dielectric discharge at Phobos. Anyway, you see here, all this stuff is, uh, you know, I think we calculated about 11 new publishable type of works out of this. So this is a rogues gallery of the, of the, of, of, uh, of various, you know, uh, the, the co-authors are kind enough to let me sort of pick their, pick through their slides, but, you know, topography and solar radiance leading to temperature maps. Tim's going to present that, I think, tomorrow. Uh, Shahab Fatemi did the plasma density about Mars using a hybrid simulation. And, of course, Phobos sort of passes right through uh, both going from the solar wind into uh, the Martian tail. So it's good to know that. Chris Hartzell was looking at forces at first contact. Dana Hurley, who was speaking a couple talks after myself, are talking about impact weathering, electrostatic potential, high energy charge particle environment, and... Uh, Exosphere uh, type emissions. Again, this is just uh, a, a, a snapshot of what we what we talked about. So some of our inputs. The first input is is Maven. And of course, Maven really spectacular new data set right around Mars. And our time periods that we looked at, decided to look at, was the space weather event 
that uh, was published in Bruce Joukowsky's science paper where he went from nominal solar wind, moving about 400 kilometers a second in relatively low densities to disturb, to highly disturb, where the solar wind was moving at 800 kilometers a second and densities were up by about a factor of 10 or so over nominal periods. And I, in fact, he, uh, Bruce is saying that that's actually when you start getting a lot of, uh, of uh, ion escape and, and atmosphere escape during these highly disturbed periods. The question we wanted to ask is what would happen if a solar storm like this hit uh, Phobos? And we'll talk about that. Another one of our assets, terrific asset, was the Community Coordinated Modeling Center who provided us context on the inner heliosphere. Uh, uh, in, in this case, during, the, during um, March of uh, uh, 2015, uh, there was a, an active region on the sun just spilling out solar storm after solar storm. Here's Mars here, and on March 9th, you can kind of see it passing by right, boom, there. Uh, that's the solar storm that we were looking at. So let's follow a thread line, if you will, of some of the work. This is an example of some of the stuff we did. So we, we had plasma data from uh, MAVEN and the CCMC, and they actually uh, gave their data to Team Plasma. And so I'm going to talk about an ambipolar diffusion code here. Uh, so when we looked at a solar storm passing by uh, Mars, we actually examined uh, this same solar activity, solar solar wind activity, uh, for for Phobos out at about 10 hours local time. So if this is Mars, Phobos would be located like right about where the dot is there. And at that time, we picked that time because the solar wind is passing right over the top of Stickney Crater, and the Mars facing side is actually in shadow. And in our ambipolar diffusion codes, what we're finding is you get large negative charging on that Mars facing side and into Phobos as well. And this is because ions aren't getting in. Remember, the solar wind is collisionless. The way it actually gets in behind objects is not through a gradient in pressure, but through electrical forces and electrical uh, stresses. So you develop these negative potentials that actually divert ions back in, in behind the object. And that's actually how this ionized gas fills in. But during a solar storm, these potentials crank up by a factor of four or so. So let's look at Stickney Crater, since we're talking about that. Let's look at the surface potential here. You can see the surface potential compared to regions above the crater drops by like 50 volts. This is for the Maven, uh, Maven densities here measured. And this model also allows us to get currents. And within Stickney Crater, the environmental currents from ions and electrons drops by about a factor of of uh, 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4, it looks kind of ratty here. The, that line, that's the electrons there, and the thicker line is the ions. Well, the reason why that's important if you had an astronaut standing on their head, mm. it could be walking, of course, but if you have an astronaut trudging along the surface, particularly in these shadowed regions, they're going to tribocharge. And as it turns out, if regolith is, regolith is a, a very poor conductor, particularly at the moon, it's a poor conductor, and if you figure it's a poor conductor at... Uh, at uh, uh, Phobos as well, you're actually grounded to the plasma, not to the surface. And so when you lose your plasma currents, it gets it harder to discharge this capacitor. You charge up and you can't get rid of it in these shadowed regions. And as an example, we have an astronaut charging model. Here we're in the top side region in the plasma flow, and here they are in the Stickney crater. And you can see for an astronaut charging, uh, getting 28 volts per charge, we we actually, uh, um, this is the tribo charging, uh, the separate formula gave us that. Well, you can see in, in the top side plasma flow, they'll, they'll get the 28 volts, but then quickly dissipate it away because uh, the environmental currents, you know, basically get rid of that, discharge the capacitor, the astronaut capacitor. But in the crater, there aren't enough currents and you can charge up. And in fact, in this model, we actually had a fairly modest amount of uh, charging. But if you actually have a big work function between the regolith and the, the space and the uh, astronaut glove or boot, you can actually uh, crank these uh, potentials up quite large. So we passed that data on to Chris Hartzell, who actually was looking at uh, the forces on a dust grain. And what she was finding is that cohesion forces tended to dominate uh, for grains. Uh, on the size of or less than uh, a centimeter or so. But, you know, if you actually start considering tribocharging, it's getting darn competitive with cohesion. And given that charging actually has a larger region of uh, influence than cohesion, cohesive forces, this could actually be a kind of a player. You might get tribocharging to get the dust near you and cohesion to really get it to stick. And actually, th these, these values could actually even be a little higher depending on the work function differences that you're using. So here's a case where we had models flow. So the take-home message 
uh, charging, you have to worry about charging, and you also have to worry about, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and actually that could even affect uh, uh, dust grains on spacesuits. So let's look at another thread line here, propagation of solar energetic particles. Uh, our, our radiation team, led by uh, Colin Joyce, actually put in a nice paper. They use their model, it's called Predix, and there's a long name for it here, but they're able to, to take uh, um, crater-validated predictions of dose rates and propagate them out to Mars. And what, you, what they were finding in a, in a January 2012 storm is that you, uh, you can get a solar energetic particle event measured at the moon. You can actually sense it at Mars, but it's, but it's actually a relatively uh, lower value. And this is their take-home message, message, which if you're in heliophysics, you probably already know this, but, but for people putting together SKGs and uh, the general audience may not, if you're not, it, how intense that uh, solar storm, the solar energetic particle event is, depends on how well connected you are to the, the solar storm. So if your magnetic field line, like here's Earth, connects directly to the most intense part of the storm, you'll get a high dose. But if, like here's at Mars, the magnetic field line connects to a weaker part of the storm, you'll get a lower dose. This is important because what it means is the architecture that we have in place to understand solar energetic particle hazards at Earth doesn't apply to Mars, particularly when Earth and Mars get have, have, are separated by large heliospheric angles, large, large uh, solar latitudes, in which case you probably need a dedicated uh, solar energetic jetic particle asset for Mars. So later on, um, uh, and, and for if you're going to send people to Phobos. So later on in this conference, uh, Dana Hurley, I think, is going to present her impact mo uh, gardening model uh, in, I think, in two talks. Andrew Poppy is presenting his model uh, tomorrow, and Tim's presenting his model tomorrow as well. So to conclude, I mean, we have a whole bunch of, of findings involving plasma and plasma charging, exosphere surfaces, and uh, uh, grain, where grain cohesion dominates. We have a new set of some SKGs to add. Some of these may be already in, but I, again, I think we need a, a self-contained uh, solar energetic particle monitor hazard alert at Mars because the, the architecture we have at the Earth-Moon system, you know, works great for the Earth and Moon, but, you know, when Mars gets out of, out of line, uh, it won't work. Um, and let's see, I, and again, just in the end, uh, the whole of this, where we bring the team together is, is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and just, you know, quietude and stuff, but it's, it's it's important. We you know it was good. It was actually the, I want I want to thank the Dream Two team members uh, for sharing and actually being so uh, actually uh, being involved in this. They did a great job put you know uh, coming together and, and uh, spending about six months of time uh, getting their models uh, in sync here. So anyway, that's 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 it. Uh, Paul Abel, NASA Johnson Space Center. So just uh, just so you know, we actually are um, looking at your your SKG list, um, and uh, we are uh, with with Ben Bussey and and uh, people here at, at Ames. Uh, we are going through the SKGs, and a lot of those things that you suggested that are new, we are um, taking those into consideration. And so so stay tuned. We'll probably have uh, some of those tied up, and then you can uh, look at them and comment them. But there, it's well documented that those are things we need to be. Uh, be aware of if we send humans to Phobos. Oh, good, good, good. Well, you know, we, we want to be helpful, you know. Yeah, just a quick follow-up on Paul. Uh, we have a, some time tomorrow that we're going to talk about the SKGs we do have. Um, I don't think we're necessarily set up to take more at that time, but certainly to discuss. And then uh, the medium-term plan is to have a, a website and a, an email address where people can uh, either send new ones that seem not to be covered, or say, "Hey, this one that you still have, we've we've closed." So, right. So, I mean, I'll just mention going back to the solar energetic particle monitor. That actually is for the moon as well, because what you really want is if you have explorers there, you'd like to set up, you know, ion and electron uh, sensing devices up, at, you know, around uh, one to ten MeV, and and there should be software. You know, it actually needs to be developed to to actually set up a first warning, so that the astronauts know to go inside for EVAs. And uh, we actually want that for the moon. It'd be great. You should probably have that for Phobos as well. There's also a suggestion we have a you know Pokemon Go set up uh, out there. So <laughs> good, good. Yeah, we're not doing that. Uh, <laughs> 
No, no, you're right. Uh, it's one of the things that we are we're looking at and having uh, having capabilities of looking at um, the the type of hazards that uh, presented to explorers based whether they be at the moon or or Mars system. Thanks. Right. Like yeah. Exactly. Yeah, good. Good. All right. Cool. Yep, thanks. Okay. Next talk by uh, Daniel Shields, the dynamical environment on and 